cloud cult here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The 2016 Summer Olympics may have just ended, but might we be seeing the end of the Summer Olympics for good? A new article in the prestigious medical journal The Lancet has concluded much of the Northern Hemisphere will be too hot by 2085 to host the Summer Olympics. Researchers are projecting only eight cities in the hemisphere outside of Western Europe would be cool enough to host the Games. This includes just three cities in North America, Calgary, Vancouver and San Francisco. The list of cities where it could be too hot is staggering. Istanbul, Madrid, Rome, Paris, Budapest, Tokyo, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and the list goes on. Extreme high temperatures have already impacted the athletic world. In 2007, high heat forced the cancellation of the Chicago Marathon. At this year's U.S. Olympic Marathon trials in Los Angeles, 30 percent of the runners dropped out of the race due to the heat. And, of course, this has implications well beyond um, athletic events. For more, we're joined by Kirk Smith, lead author of the article, professor of global environmental health at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome to Democracy Now! Professor Smith, talk about what you found. Thank you for uh, inviting me today. Well, I am, I'm sitting in Berkeley, which is part of the San Francisco Bay Area, and we uh, often repeat the what Mark Twain is often reported to say, which is, uh, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. People who've been here know it's cold and or it's cool in the summer. This is going to be an advantage in the future as uh, climate change proceeds, because, as you say, those three cities in North America, including San Francisco, San Francisco is likely to be the last place that a uh, Summer Olympics could be held, as they're held today. Now, why is that? I mean, what is it that—why uh, does heat make it uh, hard to have the Olympics? Obviously, it doesn't make any difference for springboard diving, but it does make a difference for outdoor endurance events, like uh, particularly the marathon, but others. And it's—although temperature is part of the picture, one of the things that people don't realize is an impact of climate, of climate change is that as temperature rises, it increases the, the evaporation of water from the oceans and other bodies of water, so therefore humidity goes up as well. And your ability to do outdoor work uh, is a function not only of temperature, but also the humidity. If it's 100 percent humidity, it can, even a very low temperature uh, will keep uh, not allow you to work heavily, because you need to sweat in order to give off the extra heat that your body produces when you're doing in, uh, work. So we took a look at the Olympics in this regard, because we know how they're run and what kind of, um, you know, exercise is done. And um, we took uh, con um, regular climate models that other people are using. We assumed the same projection of, climate, of greenhouse gases that is uh, in the International Hype of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the current pattern we're on. We took a, both a conservative model and a more liberal model, if you like, and averaged them, so we weren't couldn't be accused of cherry-picking. And we're surprised to find how few cities in the world were left in 2085, um, just eight outside of Western Europe, only three in North America. So, of course, we're not really uh, all that concerned about our most elite athletes. They are very well conditioned. They are very well um, uh, managed by the physicians on their teams. But it's the tip of the iceberg. The last line in our paper is, if we have to worry about our most elite athletes, what about the rest of us? Because it is the rest of us that are most at risk from these rising heat and humidity. And some, in fact, think it may be one of the, uh, the largest impact of climate change in the next 50 or 60 years will be the change in the ability to do what we've always done, doing for two million years, is work, um, work and heavy exertion outdoors. Now, probably very few people in the, listening to this program work all the time outdoors, but 50 percent of the planet does work outdoors all the time, mainly in agriculture and uh, construction. So those professions are more and more um, challenged, if you like, uh, at certain times of year as climate change proceeds. The, path, the areas of the planet that will be dangerous to do, conduct that kind of work will grow and grow with climate change. And the Olympics uh, illustrates this. We, um, of course, published this paper at the time of the Rio Olympics to call attention to the broader problem of um, climate change changing how we do things. When you talk about the reporters on the Summer Olympics, your study, what about the Winter, yes. winter Olympics? 
Well, uh, there was a paper also uh, from based on a report done in Canada that was published in 2014, just before the winter, the Sochi Winter Olympics. And they did a, a somewhat similar analysis. They took the 19 sites where there had been Winter Olympics before and examined how many of them would still be viable for the Winter Olympics in about 2085. And they found that only six of them would still be viable. There, of course, it wasn't the risk to the athletes from um, uh, exertion and, and heat. It was whether there'd be enough snow. And so they used uh, 30 centimeters of snow. You know, if you uh, was 30 centimeters, you know, 10 inches or 15 inches of snow is the minimum required for the Winter Olympics. And um, the same issue. Uh, of course, if you can get around these things a bit, you can do everything indoors. In fact, more and more, both the summer and winter Olympic events are have been moved indoors. But it's a little hard to see how you do downhill skiing indoors. And running the marathon indoors would be a pretty boring uh, event. So. Um, you, but you can, you could do it. Uh, you could do the marathon in, in January, and um, uh, if you like, um, and that would not be the same Winter Olympics. But there would be ways to adapt your way out of it. The point is, that what we've been doing for millions of years is no longer possible. We've held the held the Olympics for 2,500 years, you know, 100 more than 100 years in the modern Olympics, and we've come to expect certain, um, you know, certain ways of doing things that are not going to be possible. And in addition, of course, other people do exertion outdoors for sports. I mean, there are hundreds of marathons every year around the world in cities. And as you mentioned, those are starting to be constricted as well. The Chicago Marathon had to be um, stopped in the middle. Hundreds of athletes had gone to the emergency rooms around Chicago because of the temperature and humidity had exceeded the limits for uh, athletes. And it's, of course, it's the rest of us are more vulnerable than elite athletes who are very well trained and finished the, you know, the, the marathon runners in that marathon finished the, the, the highly competitive ones in, in a little over two hours. But, you know, three hours later, there were 10,000 other athletes still out in the heat and, and humidity. So that's why they had to stop it. And of so, course, uh, Professor Smith, uh, it's not only the athletes and then in ge the general population, but the kind of political and social uh, upheaval these this kind of extreme weather causes. Well, yes. I mean, uh, moving. I think that we think the biggest impact will be, as I say, among the poor. I mean, uh, climate change. You know, I've said before is the most, <coughs> excuse me, the most regressive tax in human history in the sense that, in general, the rich benefit from the use of fossil fuels and the, and the economy that's run by them, and the poor um, get the biggest impacts in, in terms of—I'm a health scientist, so in terms of health, it's the poor that's going to suffer most from climate change. And an illustration of that is um, the workers who work outdoors um, in, in this case. I mean, in California, for example, in the Central Valley, we already have a few workers who might die from heat exertion every year in the summer. Um, but that that will increase unless something is done. Now, what can be done? You can change work practices, allow people to sit in the shade between 10 and 2 and drink lemonade. But bosses aren't well, you know, aren't known for that kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> laxity. And uh, so uh, what happens is there gets to be a very difficult trade-off between expectations on productivity, how much you're supposed to produce, and health. That's a difficult trade-off. It's a pernicious trade-off. We want more labor to be more productive, of course, but we also want labor to be protected. Uh, and drawing, it gets more and more <clears throat> difficult. Drawing from another sports example, thousands of workers are toiling in extreme heat in Qatar, uh, building the stadiums for the 2022 World Cup soccer championships. The International Trade Union Confederation estimates more than 7,000 workers will die before a ball is kicked in the World Cup in 2022. Yeah, well, that's that's a great example, because uh, pe some people will respond to this, well, 2085 is a long way off. By then, uh, we can all be living in air-conditioned malls. We don't care about the heat outside. We don't work outside. But, of course, somebody has to build those malls or those stadiums. Somebody has to repair them. Uh, you know, we're not going to turn into uh, space colonies on the, on the planet Earth. Um, you know, maybe uh, air-conditioned cabs can be uh, developed for farm machinery in the in rich countries, but they're not going to be doing that in India in uh, even in 50 years. So, 
it um, it's a it's a set of issues. I mean, the the, the stadium in Qatar will probably be air conditioned. It's the only way to uh, protect the people who go to that uh, to go to those games and the players. But I mean, somebody has to build it, mm. and including in the summer. Well, Professor Kirk Smith, we want to thank you for being with us. He teaches global environmental health at the University of California, Berkeley. And we will link to your study, the recent article in The Lancet, which is headlined, The Last Summer Olympics, Climate Change, Health and Work Outdoors. As we